Sometimes the gaming world moves so fast that it is tough to keep up. What with technology essentially becoming outdated, the split second it settles its ass onto the market. Video game developers, publishers, and console masterminds have sought to find ways to diversify their audience base and keep things fresh over the years with all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas. Though that tends to be both for better and for worse. Motion controls can suck a nut, quite frankly. Though innovation is undeniably necessary and wanted, it too often becomes manipulated by corporate greed. And the bottom line is that all of us gamers suffer whilst companies are out there to line their pockets. Though most of these ideas might seem appealing in theory, too often they were quickly revealed to be money spinners rather than truly revolutionary concepts. All they did was make us feel more miserable and grow more jaded over the industry we were so blissfully fond of. In any case, I am the Windows 10 update of Ash from What Culture Gaming, and these are 10 video game innovations that made everything suck. 10. Escort Missions We'll start with a gameplay-based innovation, one which came about as 3D games became more complex and audacious. Having one character to control and take care of apparently wasn't enough, and so the escort mission was born whereby you must essentially babysit another character, enhancing the difficulty and putting your micromanaging skills to the test. The inherent nature of these missions means that the person you're protecting is ostensibly always feeble and irritating. Take Ashley Graham in Resident Evil 4 and Emma Emmerich in Metal Gear Solid 2, for instance. The former runs around like a headless chicken, and the latter is scared of water, so both require the player to take extreme care in shepherding them through the respective sections of the game. Escort missions are supposed to be another way to diversify play and prevent a new, unexpected challenge to players. But on the whole, all they are is really, really annoying. 9. Motion Control Tired of using a boring old controller? Want to be a little more active whilst you play? Well, now you can. The Nintendo Wii kickstarted the whole motion control trend, one which Microsoft subsequently adopted with their Kinect and Sony attempted with the PlayStation Move. It's hard to argue with the Nintendo Wii's success in making gaming more accessible to and popular with the masses, but Microsoft and Sony's insistence to elbow their way into this market feels more regressive than progressive. Sure, motion control games might be fun for a gimmick-based console like the Wii, but for serious gamers, the limitations of such devices are not worth it. Plus, they just suck. A controller may not be as exciting, but it's more reliable and malleable to our needs. This is one bubble that I am surprised is taking so long to burst. Who really wants to break a sweat whilst out dragon slaying? Not I! 8. DLC In theory, DLC is a fantastic idea. You finish playing through an awesome new game. Well, guess what? That is not the end of it. The developers are hard at work on new content for you, a steady stream of content that can be downloaded for a small price. What's not to like? I have no objection to DLC in principle. It's just so rarely that it is A, worth the money, or B, respectful of its audience. The majority of the time, DLC is developed in tandem with the full game itself but is held back as a means of being able to milk more money out of gamers a few weeks later. Some developers even have the gall to include the DLC on the disc, but force you to fork over money to unlock it. The brazen audacity of it is extremely insulting to people who have most likely already paid over the odds for the game. To try and double dip gamers so transparently is poor from both a business and an ethical perspective. 7. Microtransactions Want to get ahead of your friends but don't have the time? Want to unlock that awesome weapon but can't be bothered to do it properly? Or perhaps you're just leveling up too slowly? No worry, just hand over your credit card details and all will be unlocked. It's fair to say that the easiest way to combat this sort of shameless shilling is to simply vote with your wallet and not buy into the nonsense in the first place. But the fact that developers are brazen enough to try it on is the total lack of regard with which they hold most games. Gamers. Allowing players to progress by paying money diminishes the whole idea of gaming, but you move onward through using your skill. If it's more about the money in your bank account, then where is the satisfaction? Of course I can appreciate that not everyone has the time to grind for hours behind a paywall, but if a game is essentially punishing players for not buying into the microtransaction nonsense, then that game truly isn't worth playing in the first place. 6. Multiplayer Everything Looking at most major AAA titles these days, it is hard to find one that doesn't boast some sort of online multiplayer mode. 
The Call of Duty franchise made it clear how an addictive multiplayer suite can drive sales by keeping gamers holding onto their games rather than selling them. And so over the last few years, we have seen a greater focus on multiplayer than ever before. The problem is that though these modes are often great fun, often they're not, and are simply the product of developers desperately trying to prevent players from selling their game on. Furthermore, with so many developmental resources being poured into the online mode, surely the single player equivalent suffers. Hence, we have seen single player campaigns getting even shorter in length, in order to focus on a multiplayer mode we never even asked for. 5. Digital Gaming Don't want to leave your house to be able to play the newest and biggest games? Do not worry, my friends, you can just buy it through PSN, Steam, or Xbox Live, and download it straight to your hard drive. It is a mighty fine idea in principle, though one that is harmed twofold. Firstly, the pricing structure for games on PSN and Xbox Live in particular is completely backwards. Sony have been lambasted for allowing ridiculous prices for digital downloads of new games when the entire incentive of a digital purchase should be that it lowers production costs and therefore should be cheaper for the player. To charge over £10 more for some of these games is absolutely despicable. Then there's the more troublesome idea of ownership, that though you have a digital version of the game, it is a very different type of possession compared to having a physical copy in your home. If you're console ever breaks, which it inevitably will do, whether now or in a decade, you'll need to re-download the game from a server. And there's always a possibility that the game will no longer be supported in the future, essentially causing you to have wasted your money. It might sound like scaremongering to some, but short of a huge price discount, it always seems better to have a copy of the game you can physically touch. Not like that. 4. Quick Time Events wouldn't it be really cool if you could interact with a cutscene with just a few button presses? It would totally make the game feel more immersive and cinematic, right? In execution, these rarely turn out to be worth the trouble. Some are rendered infuriating by their unexpected placement out of nowhere. Other quick time events just feel incredibly arbitrary, inserted to try and vary the gameplay a little, even though rote button pressing is about as dull as gaming can get. Instead of telling me what to press, what about returning me my freedom as a player and allowing me to act out the scene as I wish? It is for this reason that most QTEs feel like taking part in a glorified interactive movie. 3. Free to play Free to play is a great idea in theory, but of course it'd be naive to expect that most of these games could exist without some sort of microtransaction system. With many of these games, it is implemented well enough that the game is still playable enough without spending a penny. Though if the mobile port of Dungeon Keeper has proven anything, it is how free to play can so easily become something perverse and virtually unplayable. Eurogamer famously gave this game a 1 out of 10 review, citing the severe paywalls as essentially making the game impossible to play properly without opening your wallet. Completely contradicting the idea of a free-to-play game in the first place. And perhaps most crassly of all, in the interest of keeping you plunging into your bank account, the game essentially never ends. Thankfully, most free-to-play games aren't this brazen about their practices, and though some might argue that we have little right to complain about a free game, I say it's worth naming and shaming these tactics as loudly as possible, which is why I am shouting into this microphone. In short, it's probably a good idea to approach most free-to-play games with a healthy air of skepticism. 2. Early Access Primarily applying to PC games, especially those on Steam, Early Access allows you to pay a fee which is usually less than the subsequent retail price to essentially beta test a game, often months and months ahead of release. It's a decent enough idea, but the term Early Access is something of a misnomer. It undoubtedly sounds better than pay $14.99 to beta test this game, even if that is basically what it is. Except it's really more of an alpha test since they come at a much earlier stage in development. It's easy to see this as a relatively desperate move on the part of the developers, though at the same time you'd have to be pretty desperate to play the game to pay money to try out what is very often a broken experience. That said, this model might be useful for indie developers, who don't have the money to play quality testers and at the same time the injection of extra cash will help them finish the game. But it is all too easy to see big name developers pulling out similar tactics in the future too. If developers realize they can make most of their money before the game is even out, then they will be less likely to keep supporting the product once it has actually been released. 1. Day 1 Patches Another great idea on paper. If developers make a mistake and miss glitches or bugs in their game, they can simply wait for players to send in a complaint, get to work on a patch, and then distribute it via Steam, PSN, or Xbox Lite. Compared to the pre-internet model of if it's broke, we can't fix it, it is hugely beneficial to both devs and players. It's a beautiful utility, but one that is thoroughly abused by developers. Whereas devs have had to meticulously QA test their games prior to release in the past, this has become less of a priority in recent years. As any snafu 
glue can presumably be fixed with a patch rolled around a few days after release. It allows developers to become incredibly complacent about releasing a shoddy product in order to meet a tight release date, as they can always fix it later. This will be particularly problematic in the decades to come. If you try and play an old game, if the game's servers are no longer available to download the patch, you're left with a broken husk of a game. Which frankly sounds terrifying. And that's our list. What innovations made your game suck? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. I've been Ash and this has been What Culture Gaming. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and please come back as it gets very lonely trapped inside this screen. Thanks for watching.